name's Rosie Little I am here to welcome you to your community gymnasium. We are our speaker today is Emily Hunter. Ms. Hunter is an environmental science teacher and filmmaker based in Los Angeles, California. Born into the environmental movement, her father was the late Robert Hunter. He was the first president of Green Hills, and her mother, Bobby Hunter, was actually the first woman to save a whale by blocking a harpoon. For nearly a decade, Emily Hunter has reported from the front lines of global environmental campaigns, focusing particularly on youth advocacy. She calls it ad ad <laughs> activism 2.0, activism. Ms. Hunter uses media as her tools for change. She hosted and co-produced four TV documentaries on MTV Canada and was formerly an eco-blogger for this magazine. In 2011, she published her first book, The Next Eco Warriors, which is an insider's look at the new wave of environmental activism. We actually have it outside in the lobby on sale and she's willing to do um, autographs for anyone who is gonna purchase that book, so we have that. And she's currently speaking across campuses in the US and Canada about youth's role in the change making of the 21st century. So with great pleasure, I'd like to welcome up Miss Emily Hunter. actually here 17 years ago standing at this very podium on this very stage. Um, so this is a real treat. Uh, he was speaking very much about a similar subject matter and that was environmental activism. He talked about his experience um, with Greenpeace and the Rainbow Warriors kind of movement that he was trying to spark. That was very much about the original eco warriors of the 60s and 70s. And what I'd like to talk to you about because over the generations, young people have organized, have devised new dreams for their world, and have acted for a just and sustainable planet and society rooted right here from their experiences on campus. We've seen that in the civil rights movement, we've seen that in the environmental movement, we've seen that in feminist movements. And so, again, it is really a pleasure to be here with you today. But now, when one thinks about today's environmental activism, and one thinks about the state of the world today, things are very different than they were in the 60s and 70s, obviously. One might think that we're very much even losing the battle for our planet with the multiple crises that we face. For me, as an environmental activist, I'm practically an activist born out of the womb, of <laughs> my mother's womb, um, I've seen the highs and I've seen the lows over the last 29 years of this environmental movement, this environmental fight. And I've very much been burnt out many times, feeling utterly depressed, almost giving up multiple, multiple times. Yet, despite it all, I do feel that there is reason for optimism. Not naive optimism, rational optimism. This is because as my years as an environmental advocacy journalist, I've been documenting the most exciting and promising trend. That of a new generation of eco-activists that are emerging, that are beginning to tackle some of the greatest challenges we face today. What's really interesting though, and they probably don't even fully know it, uh, is that they're actually beginning to redefine and reimagine what is activism in the 21st century. Moving beyond just the stereotype and beyond the limitations of that identity and into one that reimagines how we can affect change in new ways for ourselves. Now this is not a story we're typically told in the media and so forth. But today I'd like to share with you what I've been documenting about this generation's environmental fight. As I think there are larger implications to a cultural shift at hand. Now before I get too ahead of myself, I want us to first radically rethink the term activism altogether. This is a uh, famous street art by Banksy in the UK and I like to point out to it because it's not quite as uh, 
demonized as an, of the imagery activism is today. Yet, what we typically get in the media isn't images like this that kind of confront and challenge the stereotype. But instead, in the media, we get images like this. We get clashes with police, lots and lots of banners, uh, maybe even some smash windows these days. The world of acti activism seems very much far removed, inaccessible, and unrelatable for most. Also, when we think of the past social movements, uh, or actually we think of any kind of social movement, we, we get shown more of the past than anything, but we get shown images like this. It's from the civil rights movement, Gandhi, the liberation movement in India, the feminist movement, and so on. Social change seems like some great phenomenon that only happened in the past, never to really happen again. Especially when it's coupled with images of perceived failed social movements of today. We get shown the failed story of the Egyptian uprising and others. So we're effectively told that the world's problems today are far too complicated to make any meaningful change. But this is only one story. A story that demonizes activism, a story that belittles the effectiveness of social movements, a story that gives us very few avenues to affect change today. Now, stories are important, don't get me, me wrong. I live my life around stories, but you know, stories can really help shape our worldview from media, books, to movies, you name it. They can help shape our understanding of ourselves, our society, and our role in our world. But stories can be rewritten, and a new story can be told. So I'd like to share with you today the story that I like to call Activism 2.0, of a new generation reimagining the culture of change making. Now the first story I'd like to tell you, to give you a little bit of context into this work, is my own story. So as I was mentioning, I practically was an activist since I was young. No, I don't look like it from this picture, neither does my family. <laughs> but behind it is the fact that my parents, as mentioned, were the co-founders of Greenpeace. My dad there in the corner is the first president of Greenpeace, leading the first anti-whaling campaigns. And my mother, there in the corner, it was the first woman to save a whale by blocking a harpoon out sea on the small Zodiac boat you see there. My parents, along with original eco-warriors like them, the original founders of Greenpeace, had won numerous victories in those days, from saving whales, to stopping nuclear testing, to sparking, helping to spark a mainstream environmental movement to shape the public's consciousness on these issues. Now, when I decided I wanted to step into the front lines of activism at 19 years old, I wanted to one-up my parents, so I joined one of the more radical, notorious groups uh, today called Sea Shepherd. <laughs> so that's me with the controversial Captain Paul Watson. He is right now running from Interpol and hiding at an undisclosed location. <laughs> I like to call him Uncle Paul. <laughs> but you've probably seen Sea Shepherd or might know of Sea Shepherd um, as they have the reality TV show Whale Wars. We're that group that goes down to the Antarctic, down to the Southern Ocean, really volatile seas. We chase other whaling vessels. We will even ram into them. Uh, we'll blockade them, do anything that we need to try to protect the lives of whales, seals, and the ocean at large. This is actually an activist boarding a ship and then getting arrested for doing so. But this, we do this because we put ourselves online to try to defend the oceans. We are trying to enforce many laws that aren't even being enforced for the planet. And we are doing this as acts of civil disobedience that has a long and rich history in this country especially. But of course this activism isn't for everybody. And in fact, I wasn't very good at it myself. <laughs> I battled on the high seas all right, but I battled more with seasickness than I did with the whalers. So sometimes I'd spend half the campaign, so a full month, because we're out there two months, a full month just being seasick alone, it, and it's horrible. I don't recommend it for anybody. But, but of course, this kind of experience really you know, can get to you after a while. Not just physically, but mentally. And it sure made me question a lot of things about myself. Whether I really had what it takes to be this 
great activist as my parents were, whether I had what it takes to be an activist at all, or even what activism even really means today. Is it just filling out a stereotype, or is there something more? Now, around the same time, just as kind of my activism was beginning, my life changed dramatically. My, uh, my best friend, my father, I lost him to cancer. And this was the person who was really helping guide me in my activism. This was the person who I had so many more questions for, so many more conversations I wanted to have, and we wouldn't have them. And so there was a void in my life, and I was left to try to figure out what activism means to me. Now, around the same time, it seemed like there was also a death of another kind. It seemed that there was a death of the movement my father was trying to help build. It was the end of an era of the traditional environmental movement. As a controversial report had been released around the same time called The Death of Environmentalism by Michael Schellenberger and Ted Nordhaus. They argued that environmentalism was no longer capable of dealing with the world's most serious ecological crisis. For while the world has changed dramatically over the last 30, 40 years, both economically, socially, technologically, and most importantly, ecologically, environmentalists were using the same strategies and same assumptions we've used since the 1970s. But in the face of climate change, one of our most gravest environmental crises yet, the same old frankly, protesting the same old political lob lobbying at UN summits, trying to sway our politicians to do the right thing, just isn't working anymore on this front. That's the hard truth. So it's time for an evolution, if you will, of the revolution to evolve how we affect change. And to, as I say, reimagine how we can be activists. Now, over the last 10 years, in my pursuit of trying to find what activism means today, I've been documenting the work of environmental activists around the world. And I've come to realize that this new generation of change makers is an entirely different breed from the past. They have diverse identities, voices, faces, and tactics. They are taking down the barriers of what it means to be a change maker. It's no longer just about joining a specific group or getting tattoos and getting dreadlocks, though I do admit I have tattoos and I once had dreadlocks. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, it's not just about protesting or uh, ramming into boats. Instead, this next generation, I believe, is pushing past the limitations, pushing, pushing past this identity, making it something more by looking with, at outside-the-box approaches and making activism to be something of our own accord, defining it for our, our own generation. Now, when I talk about youth, particularly youth environmental activists, I want to explain that I'm, I'm speaking about Generation Y, millennials, our generation. I focus on them because I believe that this generation can make a significant impact, and, and, and we are making a significant impact. But I want to say that generations past have also played important roles. And I don't want to belittle that in any way. They have played extremely important roles, and people of all ages today, of course, play meaningful and positive, impact, meaningful and positive roles in today's struggles. But the focus of my presentation here today is on this generation, because I do believe that they are this missing piece of the puzzle when it comes to the environmental fight and social change. Because I say that we're missing because people pretty much think that we're like this. We're this young generation that isn't given much credit or will or say in the events happening in our planet. People don't really expect much from us. We're told to be, we're said to be apathetic or disengaged. However, I believe youth are and always have been an X factor for social change. And our role is ever more important now. <coughs> For Generation Y exists in a unique time of crisis and transformation. We are at the edge of this critical crossroads of humanity where we can either continue on with status quo of a destructive path or we can start to rebuild toward the future that we can be hopeful of again. 
That is our biggest challenge and that is our biggest test. Now, I think it's important to take some time here to kind of outlay the crisis that is before us, before our generation. We are entering this state of new normal of a climate destabilization. This last spring, we hit the highest concentration of carbon dioxide in human history, 400 parts per million. To contextualize that, the last time we were this high was several million years ago, when the Arctic was completely ice-free and sea level rises were up to 40 meters high. Now we're beginning to see that happen today. Because the Arctic just last summer was at the lowest it's ever had, has been in terms of its ice coverage, almost half of the ice coverage was gone. Also, we're seeing sea level rises. Already hundreds of millions of people are becoming climate refugees around the world every year because of these sea level rises on coastal areas and coastal communities. The ripple effects also of climate destabilization that we're seeing here in the States and North America, of course, are this higher frequency of extreme weather events. It might feel like nice right now because we have this kind of spring weather in the fall, but that is kind of the warming of the toad <laughs> in, the, in the boiling pot of water. It takes some time for us to realize what's going on. It takes our climate some time as well. But we are seeing higher extreme weather events with the floodings in Colorado, with Hurricane Sandy, to wildfires, to droughts, you name it. The list has gone on over the last couple of years. So this is the world that lays before us, before our generation. So let us be clear that environmental activism isn't just about protecting the world for some future generations as some good deed we can pat ourselves on the back for. <laughs> but instead, it, environmental activism is very much about protecting our own generation's future, as we are the ones living through this ecological tipping point. Now, I know that may seem pretty heavy, that may seem pretty bleak, and that's kind of continuing on with the hopelessness narrative I was talking to you about before. But at the same time, there's also this other story, this is new story that is being rewritten. For as Thomas, and Jeff Thomas Jefferson once said, every generation needs a new revolution. And I believe we are beginning ours now. For the last couple years, we've seen a rise in social movements from the tar sands movement to occupy, to pro-democracies in the middle, pro-democracy movements in the Middle East, to you name it, the list goes on. I don't know more, anti-austerity movements. Even in my country in Quebec, we had the largest student movement in decades um, in, in Quebec City against student debt. Young people across all of these movements have played a, either a predominant role or a leading force in these movements. And if we choose so for our planet, we can turn this moment of crisis into a moment of positive transformation. For throughout history, youth have played an instrumental role in affecting change, and we are doing it again now. But before we can truly understand our generation's role, I want to go over a brief history of the environmental movement just to be able to locate ourselves in what is happening and why it's so unique of what is happening today. So I'd like to share with you this brief history of the environmental activism culture um, evolving through time. So I'll talk about the four waves throughout the history, as well as give examples of what is happening today, as well as some trends of what is happening today. <clears throat> so to structure this piece of history, I first want to go over the activist handbook by Aidan Ricketts. He talks about the four stages of the activist journey, which not only gives us better understanding of how we ourselves individually evolve in our activism, but how social movements can evolve through time. So the first one is an awakening stage. This is where one awakens to the environmental issues and has a yearning to affect change. The second stage is the spark stage, where one, where one sees that they can actually affect change with their efforts. The third is a loss of innocent stage, where one sees that the issues they fight for are far more complex and there's corruptions that ensue that make it more difficult to fight on these issues. This can also be where people tend to kind of give up in their activism. But if they carry on, the next stage and a final stage would be towards system change, where one readdresses their own activism efforts and also where we look at the underlying root causes of what we fight for. So this first stage, this awakening stage, 
really came about in the first wave of the environmental movement when we look at the history. This started in the late 18th century to early 19th century, so this movement is actually several hundred years old. Now, this was the awakening stage because the early pioneers of this movement really saw that there was this reckless exploitation uh, by the lumber industry of, all the for of many, many forests in North America that was happening from the Industrial Revolution. These early pioneers that saw this were, ironically, hunters, fishermen, and sportsmen, not necessarily youth at this time. Um, they were those individuals because they spent the most time in the wilderness and they saw the effects of the lumber industry. Now, one leader to name in this movement is John Moore, of course. He was a naturalist writer, and he was also a bird watcher, and so he spent a lot of time in nature seeing what was going on. <clears throat> he had a passion for protecting the Sierra Nevada, and he wanted to protect these natural spaces from the Industrial Revolution. So he used the tactics of petitioning and lobbying government in around the 1890s to try to protect Sierra, the Sierra Nevada, and in that time was able to establish the first park in the Sierra. He later went on to found the Sierra Club and became the first founding president, which is actually the first environmental organization to ever exist in North America and one of the first established ones in the world. What happened, what was, what was significant about this wave is that it was because of these early pioneers, it was because of this first wave that we have many of the park systems today. After this wave, a cascade of laws emerged to protect parks and natural spaces like the Sierra, Yosemite, and others. Now, the second wave, this spark stage of what I was talking to you about, um, really started with um, the 1960s, um, actually even a time before then, of uh, this image. This image of the nuclear blast that hit Hiroshima, Japan, the mushroom cloud that we see here, really was this, perhaps a simple image, but an image that changed our consciousness. It changed us because we realized that we had the power for self-destruction. And so around this time, there was a variety of groups that emerged, a whole new generation emerged of young people, of the youth culture of that time, the 60s and 70s, that were concerned over peace and ecology. And so one group, namely, was Greenpeace, combining both. And so Greenpeace, around the late 1960s, started as a loose group of ex-journalists, draft dodgers, artists, Quakers, hippies, young idealists, you name it. And they got together to do one of the first anti-nuclear um, campaigns out at sea to try to protect an Alaskan island in the Aleutian Islands. <coughs> My father joined the group uh, as he was 29 years old and became the founding president of the organization. And he pushed the group to not just focusing on nukes, but also led, leading the first anti-whaling campaigns in the Pacific Oceans and as well as in Australia. And he saw very much Greenpeace becoming not just a single issue movement, but becoming a multi-issue international group, which has become today. Now, Greenpeace was very much pioneering in that time. They understood the media culture that was blooming in the 60s and 70s for the first time, and they used powerful images and videos, relaying it to the public, relaying it to the media, to try to shape the public's consciousness on these issues. It's what my father would call mind bombs, and to try to spark consciousness change with the media. And they're very successful at that. Now, they're also one of the first environmental groups to incorporate the Gandhi practice of peaceful civil disobedience, putting their, their bodies on the front lines to try to protect these issues in a way that had never been done before. Nobody was putting their bodies out to protect a seal or going in the oceans to protect a whale. This was just crazy, but <laughs> it sparked people and it got them thinking. And so for them, this was important to use civil disobedience in this way because it was this next generation's tactic. It wasn't just lobbying and petitioning like the previous generation had done because they found them no longer effective. They were pushing it even further. Now a third way of this loss of innocence stage. Um, this is kind of a lesser known wave, but it started in the 1980s. And it was very much this loss of innocence because during this time there was a number of corruptions that were becoming evident. Corruptions within government who had very much 
anti-environmental regulations at that time, taking away certain laws to protect certain spaces, but also corruptions even within the environmental movement itself. The mainstream environmental groups were starting to lose credit as they're seen as not effective or not putting their funds in the right spaces. At the same time, there was a plethora of numerous environmental issues that were coming up. Not just one or two issues they're fighting, but numerous, from toxic waste, the ozone hole, deforestation, and more. And so to respond to this, a new generation of grassroots radicals were emerging. They were pushing the boundaries of what was acceptable to try to fight these issues. This included groups like Sea Shepherd that began in this time. Sea Shepherd is the group that kind of uses this, um, it's called monkey wrenching or eco-sabotage. It's otherwise doing property damage as a form of protest. And so they would do things like rim into boats and so forth that they're known for. And they do this because they say that what they're doing is not violent. That actually the greater violence is harming the life of whales and our oceans at large, not towards inanimate objects and towards property. And so they became very famous in the 1980s when they rammed and sank numerous whaling ship vessels. Now I want to point out that nobody was actually on these ships when the sinking happened. It was happened in port, making sure nobody's on it. And the ramming also happens at the front of the ship, not to actually capsize or again harm anybody, and it's strategic. But nevertheless, um, they were very controversial, really got a lot of attention for doing it. A uh, number of people that still to this day are trying to track the Sea Shepherd activists down. Um, so whether you agree with this or not, this was this kind of radicalization that was happening around this time. Another key trend that was happening was, I guess you could say, a, a diversification. For the environmental movement has a history of predominantly being run by privileged culture. And Really, what needed to happen was a bridging of both social justice and the environment. And that was happening with the environmental justice movement. For in the 1980s, it was becoming clear, reports were coming out, that you know, issues of poverty and inner city issues that were not considered environmental typically by mainstream groups um, were actually extremely important and actually did relate to the environment. So while the mainstream groups weren't, weren't picking up on issues of poverty, inner city issues, the environmental justice movement was. And they were doing this because reports were coming out, as I say, of the, that the location of toxic waste sites by industry and government, they were deciding this primarily on the factors of income and race. This is a kind of eco-racism that is happening with these toxic waste sites, and still, quite frankly, happens today. But this, these groups in the environmental justice movement were emerging for the first time to try to address these issues, and the mainstream groups like Greenpeace and others would not. And so this is the first time where they're cutting across racial income and gender lines and really making it a movement for all. So this is a very important trend where the movement was going and still is going. Now, these three waves I've talked about, they're extremely important waves to understand the history and context as each generation moved the movement along. And they were written about by Philip Shabakov, who wrote the book A Fierce Green Fire of the History of the Environmental Movement. But his work stopped in the early millennia and very much stopped at these three waves. He didn't feel that the movement had carried on. But I argue that there is this fourth wave, and that is the climate movement. Now, the climate movement has had many different triggers. One could say an inconvenient truth had helped spark a mainstream awareness about the issue. But others would point to the UN um, climate report that came out in 2007 that was named climate change as unequivocal that it was man-made and that it is happening. But others would argue that even in 2005, Hurricane Katrina is what really made this all resonate, what made the message of Al Gore, what made the science resonate with this real world disaster. Now, with these kind of global alarm bells ringing climate change, what happened was really interesting because around this time, it started to become everywhere. Climate news was everywhere, the environment was everywhere, it was mainstream, it was vogue, it was popular in a way that it had never quite been before. To such a level that it was in fashion, it was uh, in clothes, it was in cars. Um, Earth Hour had 1.3 billion people participate one year. 
And almost every magazine had a special green issue, including Sports Illustrated. I'm not sure how it was environmental. I think the girls were wearing green bikinis. <laughs> but nevertheless, it was everywhere. Now, what was even more important around this time, in my opinion, was that what was emerging is a youth climate movement. This is where young women and men from all the corners of the world were being represented and having a voice in this movement. This was important because this is obviously a global issue needed a global response in return. How they were doing this was the powers of the internet. This is our tactic, our 21st century tactic. We're using the powers of internet and social media to connect, to inform, and to act in ways we can never do at a scale we can never do before. Not just locally or nationally, but globally. This is our, large, our greatest mass communication device, and we have access to it. Despite the powers that be trying to do censorship laws and get it out of our grasp, right now we have that megaphone to society. Now, these were all promising trends in, around 2009. But then Copenhagen happened. The UN Climate Summit to create an international climate treaty that was supposed to be dubbed our best and last chance to fight climate change. But like other UN summits before it, it failed. C Copenhagen turned to Hopenhagen turned to Floppenhagen within a few weeks. This was happening because in many ways we were putting all of our eggs into one basket, uh, the UN summit basket. We believe that if we just amassed enough people, we just amassed enough of the public, our world leaders would be forced to listen to us. We had 30,000 people registered inside the summit and over 100,000 people outside the summit. It was the largest public outcry of any kind of any UN summit. And yet, despite it all, our voices were left unheard. Now, around the same, just after Copenhagen, what happened then was, and what has happened since then, even to now, is a very much a well-funded misinformation campaign to try to build a lack of confidence in the public over climate science, namely funded by the fossil fuel industry. On the media's part, there's been a journalistic malpractice where the majority of climate news stories focuses on the uncertainty of climate science rather than informing the public, even while scientists, 97% of scientists, all know that it is happening and man-made. It's so far, such a journalistic malpractice has gone so far that even major media conglomerates like the Koch brothers make it a policy that reporters can't utter the words climate change or global warming in their stories. And it's become so controversial that in the last presidential election, climate change wasn't even an issue whatsoever until Hurricane Sandy had to hit. So to go back to the stages of the activist journey, we are still painfully in stage three, in the loss of innocence. As there's this greater corruption happening, perhaps one of the greatest corruptions we've ever faced. For we are getting increasingly silenced and misinformed on one of the most important challenges of our time. But if we just continue to understand that these corruptions are happening and not addressing them, then we will continue to see failure. That is why I believe we're unable to affect meaningful change when it comes to climate change, as well as other environmental issues today. We're at this impasse, and we no longer know how to get past it and affect this change. And so I believe that we now need to go towards a systematic change that the, this issue really requires. Excuse me. A systematic change that this issue really requires. So this is the next stage of our generation is to make any meaningful positive impact for our future. I'll explain more about what that means, but first, what is next? Where are we now and where are we going? I argue that it is time to evolve our activism, to reimagine how our generation can affect change appropriate for our time. Just as we saw in history, in almost every generation past, they established themselves with new identities and new tactics that are appropriate for that time to address those crises. For this, in the second wave, in the 1960s, 1970s, we saw the youth culture using civil disobedience and media tools to affect change. In the third wave of the 1980s, we saw radicalization as well as a diversification with the environmental justice movement. Lastly, in the fourth wave in the youth climate movement, we saw the internet becoming a powerful tool for mobilization. In all, 
each new generation has had a major role to play. They've evolved the movement and pushed our society to addressing the crises of our time. Now it is time for that, ne that next step. If our generation is to create a movement of our times, we need to, if you will, rebrand activism with our own identities, with our own tactics, creating our own culture of change making. Now, I know this may seem really idealistic, um, but I'd like to sprinkle some interesting facts. We are the largest generation to have ever existed. We have 3.5 billion people in the Earth's population is under the age of 30 or younger. The UN calls us the new global power reshaping the world, and if we choose to, we can reshape it for the better. Already, youth are active. Globally, young people contribute 2.4 billion hours each year to voluntary causes. That doesn't sound so apathetic. <laughs> in the environmental movement, young people, and probably right here on this campus, whether they're realizing it or not, are at the front lines of building this new movement. And in documenting this, I'd like to tell you, but sorry, but yeah, the question is, what is this new movement, this new generation's movement I've been t talking to you about? In documenting this, I'd like to tell you some examples and discuss some of the trends I've been witnessing that are outside the box and reimagining activism. The first example I'd like to talk to you about is the sharing economy. The sharing economy may be a new term for some and may be kind of a common term for others. But the sharing economy includes everything from bike sharing, car sharing, even house sharing with Airbnb and couch surfing, um, even solar pa panel co-ops to even clothing swaps. It's this idea of sharing our individual resources, our individual consumption with a community, being collective consumption. This not only reduces the demand of goods and services, reduces our consumption levels, makes a more positive impact on our planet, but it also helps foster community and collaboration. Now, one example of this is the Tool Library Project. Like a regular public library, resources are lend or shared out to the community. But instead of lending out books, it's lending out tools. In Toronto, my home city, there's a group called the Toronto Tool Library. And they're lending out a variety of tools. Everything from repairing bikes, to gardening, to even 3D printing. Very, very intricate stuff can be printed through there. Now, this might not seem like an environmental project, but this is the kind of outside the box of activism I'm trying to show. For this is supporting a do-it-yourself culture of fixing, repairing, and even making things ourselves rather than constantly hyper, hyper consumption. These are some of the projects that members of the tool library have actually built. So one built their own desk. Another has actually repaired um, a small little garden area into an art space and others have also built community gardens that were just a pile of weeds. People have done amazing projects with this. Why is this important? Oh, excuse me. <laughs> and so, why is this important? This is important because it's not just about fostering tool lovers and people who enjoy using tools, but actually helping to foster this idea of the sharing economy. Here's a little video I'd like to share with you of the Toronto Tool Library. We already have a garden oh, 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 oh. We call this a garden ring. Yeah. Tool libraries exist in other places, they just don't exist here in Toronto yet. And this is the first one of its kind. So we thought this was a great opportunity to, to do something great in the city. And Parkdale, the neighborhood that we're in, is a neighborhood that I think we think could really use it. So we're very fortunate to be able to access space here and provide this kind of service for the community. I was working at a big accounting firm and I was working for mostly large corporations and I just realized it wasn't really fitting with what it is that I was most passionate about and I felt that my skills could be used in better ways. We don't think this economy is working very well for the environment or for people in general and this is one way to you know, subvert that system and have people access the things that they would have otherwise needed to purchase. Buying tools is such a, a barrier and you, you need them. Like sometimes you don't need a drill. What you really need is just a hole in the wall. You don't use the, this stuff every day. Some people do, but you know, they could own it. But for the most part, 
vast majority of the population just needs to access it occasionally. Now we had to buy this, yeah. so for painting, but <laughs> this will be in library inventory it's after we're done. There. Yeah, see, it's, it's, it's engraved. There you go. There's the engraving. TTL, Toronto Tool Library, and we have our coding system there. So we're just in the beginning stages of the project. We just have a bunch of volunteers tearing down the ceiling, putting up drywall, and engraving tools, and inventorying all the huge donation of tools we've gotten so far. We don't want people to walk in and say, oh, the sharing economy is just this basement, ugly, damp, disgusting type of place. We want it to be bright, we want it to be the future. We opened our doors March 23rd, it's been a few weeks now, and we've had tons of people come in, even people just excited about the project, just want to see the space. And this is just the start, right? So, you know, there's going to be more and more buzz as uh, the word spreads. How's it going? Hey, good. Hey, Not my drill back. and my screws. I'm building a chair. It's hard to just buy all these tools and then store them at your house. Being able to come here and just take them as you need them and then return them is definitely way better. People are here just because they want to be part of the project. They're very excited about it and it fits with their vision of the world and that's what we want to connect with. I like the economic aspect, the environmental aspect and that's uh, what I think people are looking at when they, when they come here. It's just such a beneficial project. It just seems like the next step forward. So now, why am I showing this video about tool lovers at the tool library? This is what I've been trying to, to show examples of, this kind of outside the box of traditional environmental activism. Here's an accountant um, and an administrative assistant for a college. They got together and they built this project to help foster the sharing economy as well as be a way to try to make a positive impact for our planet by sharing these resources. And this is the kind of system change approach that I was trying to address earlier. Because this is really much about redefining activism as well as changing our current economic model with a real world community project. For these kinds of sharing economy projects that are going on are actually challenging our current infinite growth based economy model. Now typically when we talk about system change, we're talking about political system change. But that's only one part of the battle. Another system that we're just beginning to really be more critical of, beginning to try to address change on, is the economic system. Now, when the, when the economic system and the environment don't always go hand in hand. In fact, they're usually considered polar opposites and the economy always takes precedent over the environment. But again, that's how we need to redefine the environmental fight, to being these two as one, because we won't ha have an economy if we don't have a bountiful environment with resources. At the same time, our current economic model is depleting those resources and very much a model that's collapsing on itself for it. But when I speak about the economic system, I want to be clear that I'm speaking about the infinite growth model. Growth of industry, growth of consumption, growth, growth, growth. Growth sounds nice on paper, but like this cartoon shows, Infinite growth is just an impossible model on a finite resource world such as ours. It does not take into the account of the limits of our resources or our ecosystems, and it teeters us off a dangerous edge. Very much, it becomes destructive growth and exploiting both people and the planet. So this is where the alternative model like sharing economy projects that actually we have all around us, we don't even know that they're fully sharing economy projects, but they are, this is, helps us to pool our individual resources, our individual consumption as collective. And so there are sharing economy projects happening all around the world. This is actually a project by the New Economics Institute and at gtne.org. They've created a mapping system of all kinds of sharing projects, co-ops, um, tool libraries, bike sharing, even individual public bank sharing, if you can imagine that. So all around the world, this is happening. And this is not meant to be some type of utopian vision for the world, but it is an alternative to our economic system, and it is filling the gaps where our current system lacks, and ultimately one day building that alternative for us. Now, another trend, another example I'd like to go over is the online movements. Now, when we think about online activism, some argue that it encourages more passivity versus participation. 
some calling it slacktivism, armchair activism, or my personal favorite, keyboard warriors. <laughs> Yet for the youth climate movement, the online movements have been really important because, youth, because it has helped to continue to foster and grow and maintain the youth climate movement in all this time where there's been a lot of criticism and backlash. The youth climate movement has continued to thrive with the internet. But the key is as long as we can turn that online movement into offline action and mobilize, then the internet can be a powerful tool for change. One group is doing just that is 350.org. Now, 350 is a global online climate movement spearheading real world campaigns to fight climate change. For 350, use the power of their website as a type of social networking platform. People can visit the platform, they can create their own campaign page and set it up on the, where they're located, or alternatively, people can find them through this geomapping technology and actually connect with a close group to them. In this, absolute strangers are coming together in the online terms, as well as to create real world actions to fight climate change. This platform has proven so successful that in 2009, people organized, organized 5,200 climate demonstrations and rallies in 180 countries. And again, a year later, after the failed Copenhagen summit, the movement continued with over 7,000 events in 188 countries. That's just a few countries shy of the whole world. And they were doing such things as in 2010, they had work parties, which was everyone got to work on climate change themselves instead of waiting for the politicians. So things like installing solar panels on schools, retrofitting homes, even building flood dikes. In Canada, I was, had the privilege of helping to coordinate this. And in every province and territory, even up to the Arctic, we had a work party. Now, the lesson with them, oh yeah, and so actually because they were being so, so successful, CNN has actually said that they've created the most widespread day of political action in the planet's history. So not just environmental action, but any kind of political action. Now what's interesting about them isn't just that they can transfer the online to the offline, but that they're finding ways to collaborate with diverse groups. They attempt to connect with labor unions, farmers, indigenous communities, artists, musicians, celebrities, sports teams, students, and teachers, as well as faith-based groups, almost any and all sector of society. They do this by giving these communities their own voice, own rep representation, and autonomy in this movement, rather than trying to dominate the whole conversation, as some groups tend to do. So this is significant because we must take down these divisionary politics of the past. You know, divisions between different environmental groups, division between different issues, different egos, but also the divisions between ideologies, if you will, between this is social justice, this is economic justice, you know, this is the indigenous fight, and they're not environmental. But instead, we'd be more stronger and more resilient if we connected our issues and our fights with the millions, if not billions, of people fighting towards progressive causes, building this larger community of change makers. For if we can take down these barriers, if we can connect the dots with all these groups, with diverse groups, struggles, and people, and whatever issue we fight, then it becomes this greater movement, both offline, both online and offline. It's what Paul Hawken would call in his book, Blessed Unrest, this movement represents a completely different form of social phenomenon when we begin to take down those barriers. Now, this brings me to my last point. Just as we are reimagining the environmental movement, we can also reimagine our own individual activism. For again, if we think outside the box of the stereotype of activism as not just being banner waving, instead imagine using our own unique individual talents, skills, and abilities as tools for change, then anyone can be a change maker. And if we use our diverse ingenuity, uh, creativity, as a generation entering the workforce, then we can affect many revolutions in almost every sector of society. Here are some examples of individuals that are using their own individual unique talents for change. One group that I'd like to mention is Our Horizon. This is a group of artists, designers, and lawyers coming together, building a labeling campaign, a warning label campaign. Just as cigarette warning labels has delegitimized the big tobacco industry, warning about the health effects of nicotine, they want to do this but targeting big oil. 
they're using art and design, creating these simple but effective labels to target the oil industry by warning about the, health, the planet's health and our own health impacts of climate change. Right now, the group is attempting to have these labels actually put on gas pump nozzles and, and actually having this put into law. And they're going around to major cities and fighting on a municipal level to have this put into law. That way, every day that the public goes to the gas pump station, they're faced with the realities of climate change. And this also helps to create a culture that is critical of the fossil fuel industry rather than manipulated by the fossil fuel industry. Another group is the Black Fish. This is a European-based group that are a group of techno whizzes, geeks, and hackers using innovative technology to try to protect the oceans. The Blackfish is attempting to try to stop illegal drift netting operations. These are indiscriminate nets that go for miles and miles long, sometimes getting lost at sea and becoming ghost nets. But they're kind of called the curtains of death, as in the Mediterranean alone, 10,000 cetaceans, so whales and dolphins, are killed every year in these nets by getting caught and suffocated in them. That's more whales and dolphins than in any other hunts around the world. And very few people are doing anything about it but this group. And what they're doing to respond to it is they use unmanned aerial vehicles, otherwise known as drones, not attached with guns or weaponry, but attached with cameras to try to document and stop the illegal operations. Previously, we think of drones being used for military use, but they're actually starting to use this for social change ventures and see a lot more possibilities in that. Now, this summer, I got the privilege of filming them for my documentary series, and I'd like to show you, it's very rough, but I'd like to show you a little rough cut from uh, their operation. Now, pretty much everyone's coming along, isn't it? Uh, yeah, and the main strategy in terms of the coming days is still on Achitresa. We do this for one night because we want to make, make sure we, we stick to the main strategy of focusing on Achitresa for the coming days. Yeah. Also because, well, there is a potential for... Uh, you know, for trouble. So the idea is there's like a wall along the port. And the idea is we're going to go behind the wall. Uh, the idea is that uh, I think two people are going to stay in the port and they're going to see if anyone comes towards us or also, you know, alert us when ships are leaving. Actually, a couple of ships we saw kind of leaving very early, just as we arrived. They're heading towards a fishing area very much known for uh, drift net fishing. The UAVs, or known as drones, what they allow us is to actually have aerial surveillance. The fact that you have a drone that can fly over the port and can document, you know, what ships are there. What I mean, that's of course a massive, massive advantage. The problem with drift nets is that they are very non-selective, so they pretty much catch, catch everything in their path. They're often referred to as curtains of death or walls of death because everything that, you know, any animal that approaches the net gets entangled, gets stuck, um, suffocates or drowns. Yep. It isn't too opportunistic to say that they, uh, these are involved in illegal fishing, right? Well, no, well, you need the evidence. That's the problem. <laughs> so this was an interesting group because they were able to kind of use their talents in, in technology, use their kind of geek powers, if you will. <laughs> and who would have thought that playing helicopters as a kid would have paid off in terms of trying to protect the oceans? Um, so they've been able to kind of carry on their campaign, both in the Mediterranean as well as Albania and Tunisia, and document these illegal operations. And they're giving off that evidence to a big EU legal case that will once and for all stop and put a foot down on these operations. Now, 
There are many other ways in which people are using their talents and their own individual abilities to try to affect change. This includes eco-fashion, such as a group called Local Buttons, who are using um, wasted clothing material that's far too large and not going to be used, but is shipped off to developing countries and places like Haiti. They pay the Haitian uh, designers and tailors five times the wages to design beautiful clothes that's from refurbished fabrics. And so this is a way of both social justice as well as helping in terms of environmental fight. There's also people using kind of their own entrepreneurial spirit to start a new business. Young people, a 20-something year old group, um, well sorry, 20-something year old individuals who started this group called Eco Cradle, and they're providing an alternative to styrofoam packaging, which is extremely wasteful, um, and instead using mushroom matter, fungi matter, to create foam packaging, and uh, their business is really taking off. Others use their you know, art and creativity as performers and artists to create sometimes art that can actually be seen from space. Others are using te technological solutions, so again, using the tech savviness or even using science to come up with more types of renewable energy projects, new renewable and developing new pr ideas to help us kind of transition off fossil fuels. So this is an anaerobic digester um, to try to create a type of a biogas from waste and feces. <coughs> so in the end, activism isn't about filling in a stereotype, being limited by that notion of that identity. It doesn't mean being some great hero either in the world. And it doesn't always mean waving banners and getting out on sea shepherd ships and ramming into boats. But what change making does mean today is about finding our own unique role to play in this critical time. Using our own unique skill sets, talents, and even careers to affect change. Whether that's literally building the sharing economy with tools, using social media to plug into local, national, or global campaigns, using art, design, technology, fashion, farming, you name it. Whatever skill sets you have can be a tool for change. Now for me, over the years, I found my own way to affect change. In the years of documenting these stories and telling these stories of activists, I found that my own activism is storytelling. From books to filmmaking to standing right here with you, telling these stories to reshape what is possible for ourselves and what is possible for our world. And if there's one thing that I've come to realize as a storyteller is that we can rewrite the story that we've been told. Our world is not hopeless. Our future is not hopeless. And we are not hopeless. This is a moment where we can write the story of our own time. If we choose to be our own change makers now, we can write the story of our time to being one where we re reclaimed our future. Thank you. So if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I'm happy to talk to you individually as well. Right. Yes? Uh, so the question was, how is the harder economic times affecting the environmental movement and, and groups from not maybe necessarily reaching uh, their full goals? Um, so certainly, yeah, the economy has a, had a crunch on everybody and at every group and every sector. Uh, the environment is not excluded, but um, yeah, in many ways, I mean, funding, donations, as well as you know, government funding, a lot of those things are getting cut or reduced. Um, in Canada, for example, a, a big bill, an austerity bill actually went through last fall, kind of just swept under, under the carpet, if you will, of um, actually cutting a bunch of in, in funding for environmental science, um, particularly climate change research that was being done, as well as um, 
helping to protect some of the parks and helping to protect against some of the toxins and damages that could be done by industry. Um, so it kind of creates a bit of a free-for-all in that way. And the many, many years of, of getting those laws in place are kind of being swept on the carpet for a budget bill um, with our prime minister. So our prime minister, yeah, is very much this kind of anti-environmental administration and pushing for the tar sands project and so forth. So that was very much a way of continuing on industry and not giving a lot of um, respect or care or protection for our environment. We still get perceived as this great environmental leader, but that's been gone since 10 years ago. So <laughs> we're kind of more a saboteur. But um, so certainly the economic impacts has, has affected it. Um, but I think sometimes, you know, it's an excuse by government sometimes to, to cut those funds as to promote more big industry to continue on, such as the case in, in Canada. Um, I would say, you know, there, there is the way, ways of young people particularly trying to get around this, such as the case of the Tool Library where they understand that both the economy and the environment need to become an issue of one instead of always constantly seen as opposites because as long as they're perceived as opposites, the economy will always take precedent. Jobs will always take precedent. These things will always take precedent over the planet. So when we start to combine this issue and start to really assess that, you know, this model of infinite growth is the core, one of the core issues that is destroying our planet as uh, so we're just not going to relent on this current model, um, that we need to find alternatives. Um, that can be smaller community projects. That can be larger projects. Um, the New Economics Institute is trying to create, to foster this larger global sharing economy through their geomapping and encouraging and summits they have and training they have and a lot of different projects they do. Um, so there's ways where we're trying to get around this economic crunch by really realizing that these, these two are, are a single issue. It's not necessarily the opposite. So I think that's important that we reframe it, the conversation on a more public level. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, funding is always gonna be an issue with the groups um, for sure. And it's, it's unfortunate, but it's a reality. But I think as, as long as we can kind of find alternative ways to keep doing the work and passions that we're, we are passionate about and not giving that up, um, then that economic system isn't winning. Um, so I know lots of activists and I myself, you know, we find creative ways to fund our individual work, you know, and while still giving, not giving up on our, our passion for making change on these, on these issues. Um, so there is creative ways of working around as my long belt way of saying it. <laughs> um, well, any, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think more and more businesses are doing the three P's, you know, people, planet, and profit, and that, that kind of model, based model. So um, I think a number of um, businesses, actually, there's a whole new stream coming from called, um, I think it's B Corp, no, um, there's a whole new st structure coming about where it's not just the for-profit or non-profit model, but they're starting to actually merge the two a little bit, that you can actually profit, but also use that for some social good. Um, they're trying to kind of merge those avenues. A number of businesses are trying to go in that direction. Not even just environmental, there's also um, Future of Bosnia is one project, for example, that creates a branding of clothing, but puts that towards um, a Bosnia foundation to try to actually help um, youth affected by ravaged war in their country to get the training to become leaders, um, entrepreneurs, and set a new course. So there's those kinds of projects happening. Um, you know, the Tool Library, again, you know, they're a nonprofit model, but yet, <laughs> It also runs almost like a business with memberships and whatnot like that. So there's ways of, of doing that kind of stuff. I think that's also the future of redefining environmental activism is starting to think of ways that we can sustain ourselves almost like a business, but it's not, you know, geared and motivated by a profit alone. You know, there is a social change motivation there as well to use those funds in a positive direction. Um, so yeah, a number of groups are definitely going in that direction. Um, the one, last one I had shown you of uh, the biogas anaerobic digester is called ZooShare, and that's in, in Toronto. And they're using actually the feces at the Toronto Zoo um, and have made a business model out of it working with the zoo to use all that feces that would otherwise become methane in the atmosphere and using it for biogas to help actually reduce some of our electricity demands. Um, so it's really cool, and it's a really cool business model that they're doing. Um, and they're a community invested project where people get community bonds to support them and invest in that. So it's a, 
not as big an investment as fossil fuels, but it is an investment in businesses like that. So yeah, I think that's definitely the direction, more of the reimagining activist 2.0. Cool. Well, thank you so much for, for staying, and if you want to have individual conversations, I'd be happy to. So thank you, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.